Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Tammy Wolinick and Christine Laster about a shifting approach to employee learning and development. Tammy Wolinick and Christine Laster, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. It is a pleasure to have both of you. You're joining us from opposite sides of the country, Sacramento and Atlanta. That's fantastic. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about a variety of things around the shifting workplace. And I thought I would frame up the episode, generally speaking, around the shifting approach to employee learning and development, recognizing that there's a whole bunch of things that go into that learning and development environment. So this is what we'll be exploring and unpacking together today. As we get started, I just wanted to briefly introduce both Tammy and Christine. Tammy is Siemens Mobility Head of People and Organization, and Christine is Siemens Mobility's HR Director. Um, Would either of you like to share a little bit more about yourselves, your background, your personal context before we dive on into the conversation? Maybe just a brief bio. Um, I've been with Siemens for 18 years and have, and most recently with Siemens Mobility for perhaps six of those 18 years. Um, And what keeps me with Siemens and Siemens Mobility, quite frankly, is that it is an organization that constantly changing, constantly evolving. There's always something new going on. The role lends itself well. Um, to getting to be involved in all of that. And so it's just an exciting place to be. And here I am, who knew, 18 years, almost 19 years later, still with Siemens. Yeah, and a little bit more about myself, Christine Laster. You know what, it's a privilege for me to work for Siemens. Uh, It's, um, you know, some days are challenging, but it's very rewarding. Um, We have over 1,200 hourly uh, workforce in manufacturing, and there's a lot of pride in the workshop. And it just makes me uh, proud to be coming to work every day. Well, that's good. We all want to work for an organization where we're energized and excited and proud to show up and do the work that we do. Recognizing also, like you said, Christine, yeah, things are hard too. Like, it's not like everything's Mm -hmm. always roses and, um, (laughs) you know, we have, we have to deal with the challenging things as well, but that's part of the growth uh, that Mm -hmm. we go through in our careers. I think it's wonderful that you both have found a home and uh, are thriving there at Siemens and that you're creating a, an environment and a place where other people can have their careers and thrive as well. I think that's fantastic. Uh, I am a consultant and a university professor. I've been at my uh, home university that I consider my home base uh, now for about 14 years. Um, and yeah, it, it's amazing when you think about how time flies um, and how, you know, in, in this day and age where people tend to shift organizations mm-hmm. and even careers rapidly many many times uh it sounds like the three of us are kind of uh bucking that trend (laughs) and we're uh sticking around in our organizations so that says something about the organizations we work for yeah yeah i actually just had a team meeting that christine was referring to as we were preparing um and most of the folks in my team meeting last week had the same kind of seniority or tenure with the organization that we did we had a couple new people um, but overall we've had some great um, tenure within the organization. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, well, that's awesome. 
Um, so as we talk, generally speaking, kind of this big umbrella about employee learning and development, um, which I believe is one of the main drivers for that longevity, you know, for people's loyalty and commitment to their organization and vice versa, is when we have this or this really nice environment where people feel like they have the opportunity to learn and grow. Because neither of you would still be there if mm -hmm. after two years, you felt like you would butted your head up against the ceiling of your potential, right? Mm -hmm. You obviously right. would then be looking for something else. And, and lots of people find that, you know, find that they, they feel that way. They, they kind of get to where they're able to go and there's really no more place for them in their organization. And so they're going to move on. Sometimes it's because, you know, their boss isn't being proactive about helping them think about um, development opportunities. Um, sometimes it's, it's, you know, opportunities for promotion and advancement, maybe a combination. There's a variety of things that go into it, obviously. But if we can, as organizations and as leaders, uh, show how we value our people through uh, investing in their ongoing learning and development and growth mm -hmm. opportunities, I think that will really go a long way. Uh, and I think that's probably as important as it's ever been, given the rapidly changing world that we're in. And we need people to constantly be reskilling and upskilling and preparing for a future that is incredibly ambiguous and unknown. Right. Very much so. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I know um, lots of organizations have been grappling with, I know you've been uh, wrestling with this as well, is everything around remote work. Um, working remotely as a company during the pandemic is something mo many organizations were forced into. Uh, how have you addressed this at Siemens? And how has the pandemic changed some of the company's HR priorities, including uh, mm -hmm. remote work, hybrid work, and, and other related arrangements? Yeah. So maybe I'll start. And, and in general, I think you'll probably find throughout our podcast, I'm going to talk a little bit more higher level with the um, kind of what's happening globally and strategically. And then Christine is probably going to be able to add maybe some more local flavors to specifically sometimes what's happening within a site and that type of thing. Um, I was have been extremely impressed with the Siemens Managing Board from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I think it's we've just got a managing board right now that recognizes we are in unprecedented times. And from the beginning of the pandemic, very early on, they made a permanent commitment to remote working. And I think partly because, yes, the pandemic was forcing us to get out of our comfort zone and do something differently. But I think they had already, they were already in the process of being schooled and coached on the workforce has to change for the future because the skill sets that are required for the future with this heavy focus on digitalization, with the metaverse, with, you know, doing things differently and in different ways, it's not just go to factory A and make widget A, um, we're doing things so differently that, that it was an innovative managing board and they were willing to make these kind of broad changes from the top and then work with the organization to cascade that throughout the organization. And so we committed to the two to three days remote working where possible very early in, in the pandemic. And with that, we had to make sure we had tools in place that people knew how to work in this new way. And so at the same time, the managing board also made a commitment to the investment to our infrastructure um, that supports remote working to our like a real estate footprint that is more about um, shared collaboration workspaces instead of dedicated closed offices um, and to our learning platform that is really a, and that's a huge one to our learning platform that's encouraging people to learn more about digitalization more about the new technologies um, that we need to deliver to our customers at an even faster pace than we've ever seen technological innovation occur than before. And so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not just trying to get points with the managing board. Some of them may or may not know my name. I don't know. I'm not trying to get points with them, but it really starts with our managing board and, and comes from there. And then they've made that same expectation at their, the leaders who report to them and those leaders who report to them have that same expectation, et cetera. And it's just been driven all the way through the organization. So.
Yeah, so some of the things that we've had to help uh, management and leadership transition to is instead of thinking about everybody had to be on site everything every single day, um, making the uh, couple of days in the office more meaningful meeting, making sure that you're scheduling your meetings when um, on key topics when most people are gonna be in the office. So is that a Tuesday and a Thursday type situation? Um, making sure that, um, you know, everybody has the right tools if they're not able to be on site to be able to be productive in meetings. You know, we Zoom, Teams, uh, all the other tools that we've had to do. So um, transitioning from people being in their seats all day long on site to working remotely and making the time on site more meaningful um, has been a transition, but the leadership has done a really good job on that. Uh, you know, thinking about engineers having to uh, work with people in production if there's, you know, a problem that they need to be solved and, and trying to figure out how to schedule that and be, um, be proactive about solutions. And we've also worked with leaders and managers on how to manage that remote population, mm -hmm. um, that it's not, you know, I think a lot of leaders in the past really um, relied on, if I see them working, I, I'm pretty sure they're working. And, and now we've got to get them past that to, you really need to be looking at outcomes. You need to be looking at what's the result of collaboration as opposed to whether or not you actually see someone's face um, to now we do our whole performance management different um, because it needs to be about conversations. And so we've changed our whole performance management process to one that's a growth mindset, that's a growth process and it's um, growth talks is what we call it. And we're really asking managers to engage with employees on growth but at the same at the same time, they're really looking at um, aligning on expectations, making sure that what the employee needs to be successful um, is there, and that barriers are removed. And so it's just a different approach, I think, than than what we did in the past. Because in the past, you could just look and see if someone was struggling. In theory, um, you can't do that now. So managers have to be better communicators. They have to be able to hear without seeing <laughs> necessarily. So. Yeah, and, and you've addressed a little bit of this, I think, but if we could double click on it and, and go a little deeper around not only from the Siemens side, the organization side of trying to understand how to shift to this evolving workplace kind of environment, and but what are the employees wanting? What are they needing? Um, and how has this changed your approach to hiring at Siemens over the last few years? So I will say that we're really hearing that employees like the flexibility. They love the feeling of trust and empowerment. Um, and so they have been very receptive to that. Um, for the most part, they're very receptive to the different learning, the enhanced focus on learning that we're giving them. Um, if we hear a negative on that, it would be they want the learning to be meaningful. Um, and so they don't want to just learn for the sake of learning, they want it to be meaningful and, and something that they can utilize, whether in their personal life or in their career or in their um, um, specific current responsibilities. But our employees generally are very receptive to this. Um, there are some, and that's what's nice about the flexibility of it too. There are some who absolutely would prefer to stay in the office and work in the office all the time. And guess what? They can. Um, if they, if that's where they're, you know, maybe they have interruptions or distractions at home. And so they actually do feel better working in the office. That's great if that's where they want to work. Um, but there's some who need a little more flexibility. We just do ask that in general, on average, we're looking at two to three days because we do still think that that the relationship building is still very important. Um, and we do recognize that it's a challenge to hire new people into a two to three day uh, remote. Um, it, it's attractive at, as attracting people to the workplace, um, but helping them then learn um, what I'll call some of the hidden culture aspects of, and that type of thing if they're not daily on site can be difficult. And so managers are having to stretch to do that a little bit differently. 
Um, and we're doing much more stressing, assigning buddies and things like that than we probably did in the past. But uh, Christine, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. And I'd kind of go back to, um, you know, when uh, we all learned about COVID and the changes that we had to go through. Um, one thing that we learned and helped management through is that when we were bringing people back to the office, many of them were afraid to come back to the office. Mm -hmm. So we had to work through that. And, and as Tammy mentioned, listening to the concerns of the workers, listening to you know, how they felt and how we could help them. Um, it was a transition, but we've been pretty successful at getting people back um, because now they understand how important the collaboration and the relationships that they build, the trust that they're building. So it, it was quite a transition probably a year ago when we started this. Um, and, and I can see that it's been more successful and the leaders seem to be thinking that it's um, been impactful now getting people back into the office, but again, still with uh, some flexibility. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And I know um, in the preparation for the show today, you know, I was looking at some of the, the stuff in the Sacramento facility. So Siemens Mobility Sacramento facility is one of the biggest of its kind in the world. Um, lots of hiring of manufacturing positions. How are you navigating that? Um, obviously, that is complicated when we're talking about this whole world of maybe remote or hybrid work. Um, how are you dealing with that in a manufacturing setting? Uh, and then let's finish off by talking a little bit more in detail about what you're doing in investing in your people around the learning and development strategies at Siemens. Yeah, um, to go back to your original question about um, the manufacturing, I mean, um, what we've done is we've partnered with uh, many different people in the uh, organization and outside of the organization. We've built, a, you know, years ago, we understood that we had a pipeline of employees that didn't exist that we needed. Um, COVID did not help that challenge, uh, but we did continue our hiring during the whole um, uh, COVID situation, and obviously we're still dealing with it, uh, but with that, we had to make sure that we had several new safety um, procedures in place for cleaning and making sure employees felt safe. Um, and then once we got through all of that training, all that communication and all of those procedures in place, then we focused on building our pipeline. We built uh, relationships with uh, many of the local colleges. We went out as far as 50 miles from our site. Um, we actually um, started to go and visit their classes to let them know what Siemens could offer them with no promise of any jobs. Um, but we were able to get uh, many people uh, interested in Siemens. We provided tours on site of those classes so that they could see the facility, uh, see how clean it was, um, see the work that was being done. And again, the pride of the, you can't say uh, enough about the pride that the actual workers have building these because we would have them speak to the students to let them know why do they love working at Siemens. Um, so we built all of these partnerships. We have a very strong um, partnership with Lois Rios District Community Colleges. They have welding programs. We, um, you know, we just partnered with them very, very well. And we also have a nonprofit, Sacramento Valley Manufacturing Alliance, that one of our uh, directors on site actually is part of that um, organization. And he's working with other companies who also are struggling to find workers in manufacturing to help build their pipeline. So we're all kind of helping each other. And I think the outreach, um, you know, to the various workforce development areas in your region, mm -hmm. you know, including colleges, universities, uh, and other, you know, government facilities, I suspect, um, all of that, you know, I think is, is a really good model. Uh, for what organizations can and should be doing as they're trying to attract great talent uh, to come and do work. Uh, and it's like you said, if it's hard to find good people, you got to be proactive and going out to find them. You can't just expect them to like somehow magically just show up at your door <laughs> ready right. to work. Right. Right. 
Right. And, and one additional thing, uh, once we actually got people in the door, then we invested in additional training. We have our own on-site uh, weld education center that, uh, depending on the skill set of the welder, they're in that training for an additional four weeks to 12 weeks, depending on their skill set. And will they'll be placed in the business. For our assemblers, we have an additional five days of training for them to get uh, up and running um, quickly. And before we created those training programs, we were losing a lot of people because they didn't understand the job, they didn't understand what was needed of them, felt that they didn't have good enough training. So we learned a lot over the last five years. I think their welder certification program um, and working with the local universities was critical. Um, and if yeah. anything, we know that our volume is going up. Um, it, we have a very successful business unit out there. And so we need to constantly be prepared to scale up. Um, and that's what the site has really focused on, how we partner with the universities, partner with the community um, to make it successful so that we can do so. Yeah, they've done a great yeah job. fantastic. And and Christine, you were talking a little bit about, you know, as you're recruiting, you're you're leveraging uh, learning and development opportunities as a recruitment tool, right? <laughs> as you're going into universities and colleges, as you're onboarding people and helping them understand the, this is how we're going to help you get certified. This is how we're going to, you know, help you do the, this X, Y, Z thing so you can grow in your career. Maybe talk just a little bit more about that in our final few minutes. Yeah. I mean, uh, to be honest with you, we're even actually starting at the high school level. Um, because we know um, the workforce that we're going to need in the future. Uh, we may not know all the jobs that we're going to need in the future, but we know that we're going to need a manufacturing uh, workforce. So we are um, working to educate um, people who are still in school on what maybe to focus on. Some of them want to get into engineering, right? So we give them ideas on here's some things that you might want to focus on if you want to um, maybe start as a welder and advance into engineering, maybe start as an assembler. We've had some really success uh, stories where people have walked in to Siemens, very little skill set, and now are very key workers in our engineering uh, and other facilities uh, departments throughout our facility. And it doesn't hurt that we manufacture trains. It doesn't. How cool is that? <laughs> I, earlier, I said we make, you know, people make widgets. We don't make widgets. We make trains. So, yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, fantastic. Well, Christine and Tammy, this has just been a really great conversation. A little bit of a um, look behind the curtain at Siemens and what you're doing there and the really cool stuff that's happening, um, especially over the last few years as every organization has been grappling with these shifts and adjustments in the labor market and in the world of work. As we get uh, close to wrapping up now, I just wanted to give each of you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about Siemens, how they can uh find out more about uh, your teams, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Okay. Um, easiest way to connect is probably through LinkedIn. Um, both Christine and I are on LinkedIn. So Tammy, T-A-M-I dot Wolinick, W-O-L-O-W-N-I-K. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and then we also have um, a lot of strong um, social media presence. You can look up Siemens Mobility. We have strong social media presence where you can learn more about the products we manufacture, the customers, and the markets that we're in. And uh, Christine Laster, um, did everything that Sam Tammy said. Uh, I'm Christine Laster, uh, Christine.Laster at Siemens.com, and uh, we can help get connected with the right people. Wonderful. And if you were going to have one nugget takeaway for our conversation today, what would that be? I think management and leadership have to be engaged in wanting to be the employer of the future and being innovative. And once you get that, the rest is very doable. Well, thank you both. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Tammy and Christine can do and find out more about what they're doing there at Siemens. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support.
Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.